So, hello. A few minutes and we start. Yes, in the comments on YouTube, uh, please write your name and group number. And uh, in the middle of our lecture, I will check it because we just started. And I need to see how many students here for now. But let's wait one, two minutes and then start. So today is lecture number four. In psychology part, we've got one lecture more. So number four and number five. And in the calendar, we can see. So our last lecture about psychology will be 12 November. And then we start pedagogy. So from the 26th of November, we start um, pedagogy part. Mm -hmm. Great. 14, 28, 27, 26. Nice to see you. Okay, let's start. Then in the middle of the lecture, I will check one more time. So, this is our lecture for today. And we will speak about perception attention and memory what does it mean in psychology what kind of perception and attention and memory we have also i show you some video and some interesting experimental video and uh, one of this video small video later we discuss uh, on our seminar so perception attention and memory uh, today, near evening, I download this presentation to WhatsApp group for mentor and uh, then later to Portal Usu. So, first of all, uh, perception, attention and memory, all its cognitive process. Of course, we've got not only attention, memory and perception in cognitive process, but today we will speak about these three. And uh, our next lecture also we will speak about um, sensation and our feeling, emotion and so on. But today we discuss this three very important part. So first of all, perception. What is perception? Perception is the sensory experience of the world. It involves both organizing environmental stimuli and actions in response to this stimuli. Through the perception process, we gain information about the property and elements of the environment that are critical to our survival. Perception not only creates our experience of the world around us, it allows us to act with our environment. Perception includes the five senses – touch, sight, sound, smell and taste. It also includes uh, what is uh, known as proprioception, a set of senses involving the ability to detect changes in body position and movements. 
It also involves the cognitive process required to process information, such as recognizing the face of your friend, for example, or detecting a familiar stand. So, small history of perception. Interest in perception dates back to the time of the ancient Greek philosopher, who were interested in how people know the world and gain understanding. As psychology emerged as a science separate from philosophy, researchers became interested in understanding how different aspects of perception worked, particularly their perception of color. In addition to understanding the basic psychological processes that occur, psychologists were also interested in understanding how the mind interprets and organizes these perceptions. The Gestalt psychologist proposed a holistic approach suggesting that the sum equals more than the sum of its part. Cognitive psychologists have also worked to understand how motivations and expectations can play a role in the process of perception. Today, researchers also work to investigate perception on the neural level and look how injury condition and substance may affect perception. So, we've got different types of perception. Some of the main types of perception, perception sorry, include vision, touch, sound, taste and smell. There are also other senses that allow us to perceive things such as balance, time, body position, acceleration, and the perception of internal state. Many of these are multimodal and involve more than one sensory modality. Social perception, or the ability to identify and use social cue about people and relationship, is another important time of perception. The particular process is a sequence of steps that begins with the environmental and leads to our perception of a stimuli and action in response to the stimuli. It occurs uh, consciously, but you do not spend a great deal of time thinking about the actual process that occurs when you perceive the many stimuli that surround you at any given moment. For example, the process of uh, transforming the light that falls on your retinas uh, into an actual visual image happens unconsciously and automatically. The substance change in pressure against your skin that allow you to feel objects occur without a single touch. Perception acts uh, as a filter that allows us to exist and interpret the world without becoming overwhelmed by evidence of stimuli. So, step in the perceptual process. First of all, is unrational stimuli, the attended stimuli, the image of the retina, transduction, neural processing, perception, recognition, and action. And of course, we will speak about them more deeply. Also, you can see what perception gives us to our sensory system, to our cognition, to our knowledge, vision, and we see that perception uh, is a very important part of our mind, of our um, conscious and unconscious uh, thought. Impact of perception. In order to see the impact of perception, it can be helpful to look at how the process works. This varies somewhat for every sense, in the case of visual perception. So, the environmental stimuli. The world is full of stimuli that can attract our attention through various sense. The environmental stimuli is everything in the environment that has the potential to be perceived. The attendant stimulus. The attendant stimulus uh, is the specific object in the environment on which attention is focused. The image on the retina. This involves lights actually passing through the cornea and pupil and uh, onto the lens of the eye.
The cornea helps focus the light as it enters the eye, and the areas of the eye control the size of the pupils in order to determine how much light to let in. The cornea and lens act together to project an imaged image into the retina. A transduction. The image on the retina is then transformed into electrical signals in a process known as transduction. This allows the visual message to be transmitted to the brain to be interpreted. Neural processing. The electrical signal, then neural processing. The path followed by a particular signal depends on what type of signal it is, for example, auditory signal or a visual signal. Perception. In this step of a process, you perceive the stimuli object in the environment. It is at this point that you become consciously aware of the stimuli. Recognition. Perception doesn't just involve becoming consciously aware of the stimuli, it is also necessary for the brain to categorize and interpret what you are seeing. The ability to interpret and give meaning to the object is the next step, known as recognition. Action. The action phase of perception involves some type of motor activity that occurs in response to the perceived and recognized stimulus. This might involve a major action, like running toward a person in distress or something and subta blinking your eyes in response to a puff of dust blowing through the air. The perceptual process allows you to experience the world around you and interact with it in ways that are both appropriate and meaningful. So, our perception can also be affected by our beliefs, values, prejudices, expectations, and life experience. For example, Marshall Siegel, Donald Campbell, and Melvin Herkowitz in 1963 published their result of a multinational study in which they demonstrated that individuals from Western culture were more prone to experience certain types of visual illusion than individuals from non-Western culture and vice versa. One such illusion that Westerns were more likely to experience was the Muller liar illusion. The line appeared to be different lengths, but they are actually the same lengths. You can see it here on the picture. When we see it the first time, we can thought that they are, for example, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, but this is the same size, the same length. You can check it is the same, absolutely. But this is illusion. We thought that they are different. You can see it on the picture A and picture B. So, I think you see it on the picture. Uh, some tips and tricks. Uh, there are some things that you can do to might help you perceive more in the world around you, or at least focus on the things that are important. So, pay attention. Perception requires you to attend to the world around you. This might include anything that can be seen, touched, tasted, smelled, or heard. It might also involve the sense of proprioception, such as the movement of the arm and leg or the change of position of the body in relation to objects in the environment. Second, make meaning of what you perceive. The recognition stage is an essential part of perception since it allows you to make sense of the world around you. By placing objects in meaningful category, you are able to understand and react appropriately. Third, take action. The final step of the uh, perceptual process involves some sort of action in response to the environmental stimulus. Uh, 
This could involve a variety of actions, such as turning your head for a closer look or turning away to look at something else. Potential pitfalls the perceptual process doesn't always go smoothly and there are a number of things that may interfere with perception. Perceptual disorders are cognitive conditions that are marked by an impaired ability to perceive objects or concepts. Some disorders that may affect perception include Spatal neglect syndromes, which involve not attending to stimuli on one side of the body. Presopognosia, a disorder that makes it difficult to recognize faces. Aphantasia, a condition characterized by an ability to visualize things in your mind. Schizophrenia, which is marked by a normal perception of reality, and some of this condition may be influenced by genetic, while other result from straw or brake injury. One interesting picture about our perception. You can see this image and uh, what do you see on this picture? We can see a lot of different things. It's really interesting try to find uh, different pictures. So what we can see here? We can see something like a cap or a cup um, or like candle. We can see uh, uh, old woman and old man. We can see young woman and young man with guitar. Also, we can see small woman here. So a lot of things. And uh, first of all, you see something, um, for example, just two faces. And then when you look more closely, when you think about it, you saw another in this picture. And in the internet, we've got a lot of different illusions like that, and it's really interesting. And also, we will see a small video about perception as usual. I always show you some different video. So, first of all, let's speak about perception. In just three minutes. Sensation is the process of detecting an environmental stimulus and converting that stimulus into neural activity. The steps of sensation are similar for each of the five major senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. First, sense organs receive a specific type of sensory stimulation, for example, light entering the eye. Then specialized sensory receptor cells, in this case rods and cones in the retina, convert that environmental stimulus into a neural signal, a process called transduction. These signals then pass through the thalamus, a brain structure below the cortex that acts as a relay station for sensory systems. It's then routed to areas of the brain specialized to process that information. For example, the occipital lobe processes visual signals. Other senses follow a similar path. Signals in response to sound are sent to the temporal lobe. The parietal lobe processes touch and temperature. And the gustatory cortex processes taste. The only stimulus that this doesn't apply to is smell. Neural signals for smell don't pass through the thalamus. Instead, they pass through the amygdala, which is associated with emotion, and the hippocampus, which is associated with memory. The process doesn't end there, because after sensation comes perception, the identification and interpretation of a stimulus. Perception is what's done with sensory information that we take in. It's how we make sense of the world. Whether a stimulus is perceived depends on a number of characteristics. The absolute threshold of sensation is the minimum amount of stimulus intensity needed for a receptor to react. For example, the absolute threshold for sound would be the lowest volume of a tone that can be perceived by individuals. The just noticeable difference is the minimum change in stimulus intensity that can be detected. 
For example, it would be difficult to tell the difference between a 50 pound weight and a 51 pound weight, but relatively easy to tell the difference between a one pound weight and a two pound weight. Sensory adaptation occurs when a sensory receptor cell's response starts to decrease after continuous or repeated stimulation, which reduces the perceived intensity of a stimulus. For example, you might easily detect a foul odor when you walk into a room, but over time, you perceive it less and less. Sensory adaptation can occur in any of the five major senses. An interesting aspect of perception is perceptual constancy, the tendency to see familiar objects as unchanging even when there are slight changes to the stimulus. This allows us to recognize objects as having a constant shape, size, and color regardless of viewing angle, lighting condition, or distance from the object. Perceptual set is the human tendency to perceive some stimuli, but not others, and to base expectations on past experiences. It can influence how people interpret ambiguous information and sometimes lead to processing errors. Perceptual constancy and perceptual set are both top-down processes that use what a person already knows to influence the interpretation of incoming sensory information. It's what allows us to read a sign even if it's missing several letters. But we can also use bottom-up processing when the brain uses raw sensory data to create a perception. Let's check. Great. Now I see a lot of students from different group and it's really good. When we finished our lecture, I also got this chat and I see how many person from group from 40 till 31 is here. But who is write your name here? Good job. Yes, I see a lot of a lot of different name. Great, thank you. So this was small video about perception. Next step, attention. So what is attention? Attention is a limited resource used to selectively concentrate on some information while ignoring other perceivable information. Attention is the behavioral and cognitive process of selectively concentrating on a discrete stimulus while ignoring other perceivable stimuli. It's a major area on investigation within education, psychology and neuroscience. Attention can be thought of as uh, allocation of limited processing resources. Your brain can only devote attention to a limited number of stimuli. Attention comes into play in many psychological topics, including memory, vision, and cognitive load. Understanding attention. Think of attention as a highlighter. As you read through a section of a text in a book, the highlight section stand out, causing you to focus your interest in this area. It is not just about centering your focus on the particular thing, it also involves ignoring the great deal of competing information and stimuli. Attention allows you to tune out information, sensation and perception that are not relevant at the moment and instead focus your energy on the information that's important, important right now. Not only does our attention system allow us to focus on something specific in our env environment while tuning out irrelevant detail, but it also affects our perception of the stimuli surrounding us. The role of attention in learning and thinking. 
Attention is a basic component of our biology present even at birth. At birth. Our origin reflex help is the term which events in our environment need to be attended to, a process that aids in our ability to survive. Numerous attend to environmental stimuli such as loud noises, attach against the check triggers the rooting reflex causing the infant to turn his or her head to nurse and receive uh, nourishment. This origin reflex continue to benefit us throughout life. Attention play a critical role in almost every area of life, including school, work, and of course relationships. It allows people to focus on information in order to create memory. It also allows people to avoid uh, distraction so that they can focus on and complete specific tasks. There, were, uh, there has been a, a tremendous amount of research looking at exactly how many things we can attend to and for how long. Key variables that impact our ability to stay on task include how interested we are in stimuli and how many distractions there are. So, we've got different types of attention and let's discuss them. So first of all, sustained attention. This form of attention, also known as concentration, is the ability to focus on one thing for a continuous period. During this time, people keep their focus on the task and continue to engage in a behavior until uh, the task is complete or certain period of the time has elapsed. Research suggested that sustained attention because during the early thoughts uh, and then gradually decline as people age. Next is alterating attention. This type of attention involves multitasking of effortlessly shifting attention between two or more things which are different cognitive demands. It's not about focusing on more than one thing at the same time, but about stopping attending to one thing and then switching to the next task. Selective attention. Since attention is a limited resource, we have to be selective about what we decide to focus on. Not only must we focus our attention on a specific item on our environment, but we must also filter out an enormous number of other items. Selective attention involves being able to choose and selectively attend to certain stimuli in the environment, while at the same time turning other things out. For example, you might selectively attend to a book you are reading while turning out the sound of your next door neighbor's car alarm going off. This type of attention requires you to be able to turn out external, external stimuli, but also internal distractions such as thought and emotion in order to stay selectively attuned to a task. Next is focused attention. This type of attention involves being able to be suddenly drawn to a specific visual, auditory or tasteful stimuli such as a loud noise or a flash of light. This is a way of responding rapidly to external stimuli, which can be particularly important in situations where something in the environment requires immediate attention and quick action. Limited attention or divided attention is a form of attention that also involves multitasking. In this case, however, attention is divided between multiple tasks. Rather than a shifting focus, people attend to the stimuli at the same time and may respond uh, simultaneously to multiply domains.
visual attention. Generally speaking, visual attention is thought to operate as a two-stage process. In the first stage, attention is distributed uniformly over the external visual scene and the processing of information. In the second stage, attention is concentrated to a specific area of the visual sense. It is focused on specific stimulus. There are two major models for understanding how visual attention operates, both of which are loose metaphors for the actual neural processing curing. Multitasking attention. Multitasking can be defined as an attempt to perform two or more tasks simultaneously. However, research shows that when multitasking people make more mistakes or perform their task more slowly. Each task increases cognitive load. Attention must be divided among all of the component tasks to perform them. Spotlight model. The term spotlight was inspired by the work of William James, who described attention as having a focus, a um, margin, uh, and a fringe. The focus in the certain area that excites higher resolution information from the visual scene where attention is directed. Surrounding the focus is the um, fringe of attention, which extracts information in a much more crude fashion. This fringe attaches uh, out to a specific area, and the cutoff is called margin. Also, you can see it on the picture. So also on this picture, we can see two of the most useful and important parts of attention, focused attention and divided attention, and to see some of this type. So you can see this picture. Many aspects of attention have been studied in the field of psychology. In some respects, we define different types of attention by the nature of the task used to study it. Attention in the context of this type of search task refers to the level of sustained attention or uh, vigilance one can maintain. In contrast, divided attention tasks allow us to determine how well an uh, individual can attend to many sources of information at once. Special attention refers especially to how we focus on one part for our environment and how we move attention to other locations in the environment. There are all examples of different aspects of attention, but an implied element of most of this idea is the concept of selecting attention. Some information is attended to while other information is intentionally blocked out, and it is normal for our brain. And also about attention, we will see some video. First, it will be generally about what is attention. Uh, first, it will be generally about attention, and then I show you two very interesting and uh, funny video about our attention. People are constantly bombarded with stimuli sights, sounds, odors, feelings, and in order to zero in on any of them, we rely on attention, focusing on a specific stimuli in our environment. Specifically, we engage in selective attention by choosing certain stimuli in the environment to process while ignoring the rest. Like how people turn down the car radio when they are looking for a particular road or address. But sometimes we also need to exhibit divided attention, 
where we attend to multiple sources of information at once. A popular example of this is the cocktail party effect. Have you ever been at a party, engaged in a conversation with someone cool, and then you hear someone mention your name across the room? You become aware of it almost immediately, even though you weren't paying conscious attention to it. In this case, your name triggers selective attention, causing you to filter out the other stimuli upon hearing your name. This can be mimicked in the lab using a dichotic listening task. In this task, a listener wearing headphones receives a message in the right ear and another in the left. The listener is asked to attend to only one of these messages and repeat it word for word. Afterwards, they are quizzed on the material that was played in the non-shadowed ear, the one that they weren't attending to. Individuals can typically remember only superficial aspects of the non-shadowed message, such as whether the speaker was male or female, the number of people speaking, and a little bit about the topic of the message. But regardless of whether they are consciously aware of it, some aspects of the message still come through. For example, the listener's interpretation can be influenced by what is played in each ear. If the sentence, they were throwing rocks at the bank, is played in the shadowed ear, the word bank is more likely to be interpreted as a financial institution if the word money is simultaneously played in the non-shadowed ear. If the word stream is played in the non-shadowed ear, the bank is more likely to be interpreted as the side of a river. But our attention isn't perfect. People are both unaware of many aspects of their environment and blind to that lack of awareness. Inattentional blindness is the failure to notice an unexpected object or event when one's attention is focused on something else. This has been demonstrated in many rather humorous studies. In one study, people were told to count the number of times folks wearing white shirts in a video passed a basketball. Then, in the middle of the video, a guy in a gorilla suit walks straight through the scene. Because they were so focused on counting the number of passes, half of the viewers failed to notice the gorilla. Half! It's easy to laugh at this, but this lack of awareness can actually have some far-reaching consequences. Like when drivers fail to notice pedestrians or cyclists because their focus is elsewhere. Another example of our lack of awareness is change blindness, the failure to notice a change in a stimulus event. For example, did you notice anything that changed over the course of this video? It's kind of hard to notice change, especially when we don't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Great. And now I show you two uh, really interesting um, video. One of them also you heard about him. Uh, this is a um, British video like test your attention. Clearly somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest... Lady Smythe.
So this was an example how our attention work. I think uh, you didn't see this 21 change because you see the story. And uh, this is how our attention work. Another example. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So this is an example of advertising, um, Great British advertising, but uh, we see how our attention work. At, uh, when we are focused on one thing, we can easily lost and didn't see another thing. So this is our attention. And next part, it's our memory. So now we will speak about our memory. Memory is the ability to take an information, encode it, store it and retrieve it at a later time. Memory refers to the processes that are used to uh, accurate store, retain and later retrieve information. There are three major processes involved in memory, its encoding, storage and retrieval. Uh, human memory involves the ability to both preserve and recover information we have learned or experienced. As we all know, however, this is not a flawless process. Sometimes we forget or misremember think it's normal. Sometimes things are not properly encoded in memory in the first place. The study of human memory has been a subject of science and philosophy for thousands of years and has become one of the major topics of interest within cognitive psychology. So, how all memories are formed? In order to form new memories, information must be changed into a usable form, which occurs through the process known as encoding. Once the information has been successfully encoded, it must be stored in the memory for later use. Much of the stored memory lies outside of our awarenesses most of the time, except when we actually need to use it. The retrieval process allows us to bring stored memory into conscious awarenesses. So, how long do memory last? Some memories are very brief, just second long, and allow us to take in sensory information about the world around us. Short-term memory are a bit longer and last about 20 or 30 seconds. This memory mostly consists of the information we are currently focusing on and thinking about. Finally, some memories are capable of uh, enduring much longer, lasting day, week, month or even decades. Most of these long-term memories are outside of our immediate awarenesses, but we can draw them into consciousness when they are needed. And here also in picture you can see some of part of our memory in our brain. Uh, to use the information that had been encoded into memory, it first has to be retrieved. There are many factors that can influence how memories are retrieved, such as the type of information being used and the retrieval case they are present. 
Of course, this process is not always perfect. For example, have you ever felt like you had the answer to a question right at the tip of your tongue, but you couldn't quite remember it? This is an example of perplexing memory retrieval problem known as uh, uh, lithologia or the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Organizing memory. The ability to access, access uh, and retrieve information from long-term memory allows us to actually use these memories to make a decision, interact with others and solve problems. But how is information organized in our memory? One way of thinking about memory organization is known as the semantic network model. This model suggests that certain triggers activate associated memories. A memory of a specific place might activate memories about related things that have occurred in that location. For example, thinking about a particular campus building might trigger memory of attending classes, studying and socializing with peers. So, the memory process. Memory is the ability to take information, store it and recall it in later time. In psychology, memory is broken into three stages – encoding, storage and retrieval. Also, you can see it here. So, encoding or registration – the process of receiving, processing and combining information. Encoding allows information from the outside world to research our sense in the forms of chemical and physical stimuli. In this first stage, we must change the information so that we may put the memory into the encoding process. Second, in storage, the searching of a permanent record on the encoded information. Storage is the second memory stage of process in which we maintain information over a period of time. 3. Retrieval or recall or recognition. The calling back of storage information in response to some cue for use in a process or activity. The third process is the retrieval of information that we have stored. We must locate it uh, and return it into our consciousness. Some retrieval attempt may be effortless due to the type of information. Problems can occur at any stage of the process, leading to anything from uh, forgetfulness to amnesia. Distraction can prevent us from encoding information initially, information not be, not be stored properly or might not move from short-term to long-term storage, and or we might not be able to retrieve the information once it's stored. That's why we've got a lot of um, movie about, for example, problems which uh, different um, memory process. So, let's speak about types of our memory. First is sensory memory. Sensory memory allows individuals to retain impression of sensory information after the original stimuli has uh, cased. One of the most common examples of sensory memory is fast-moving light in darkness. If you ever lit a sparkler on the 4th of July or watch traffic rush by night, the light appears to leave uh, a trail. This is because of iconic memory, the visual sensory store. Two other types of sensory memory have been extensively studied. Iconic memory, the auditory sensory store, and haptic memory, the tactile sensory store. Sensory memory is not involved uh, in higher cognitive function like short and long term memory. It is not consciously controlled. The role of sensory memory is to provide a detailed representation of our entire sensory experience for which relevant pieces of information are extracted by short term memory and processed by working memory. Short-term memory. Short-term memory is also known as working memory. It's hold only a few items. Research show a range of seven plus minus two items, and only lasts for about twenty seconds. 
However, items can be moved from short-term memory to long-term memory, where processing lines are residual. An example of rehearsal is when someone gives you a phone number verbally and you say it to yourself repeatedly until you can write it down. If someone interprets your uh, rehearsal by asking a question, you can easily forget the number since it's only being held in your short-term memory. That's the problem of rehearsal. Long-term memory. Long-term memories are all the <coughs> sorry. Long-term memory are all the memories we hold for periods of time longer than a few seconds. Long-term memory encompasses everything from what we learned in first grade to our old addresses to what we were to work yesterday. Long-term memory has an incredibly vast storage, uh, and some memory can last from the time uh, they are created until we die. There are many types of long-term memory. There are many types of long-term memory. Explicit memory can be further subdivided into semantic memory. And episodic memory, for example, Mona Lisa, uh, when I was in Paris, I saw the Mona Lisa. It will be our personal experience. In contrast to explicit uh, or declarative memory, there is also a system for procedural or implicit memory. These memories are not based on consciously storing and retrieving information, but on implicit learning. Often this type of memory is employed in learning new motor skills. An example of implicit learning is learning to ride a bike. You do not need to consciously remember how to ride a bike. You simply do it. This is because of implicit memory. And if you, for example, um, didn't uh, ride a bike for a month or years, uh, you still remember how to do it, because it's in the long-term memory. Of course, we've got some problem with our memory. For example, some losing memory. Forgetting is a um, very important event for us, uh, because just consider how often you forget someone's name or overlooked an important appointment. Why do we forget information we have learned in the past? There are four basic explanations for why forgetting a cure. Uh, failure to store, interference, motivated forgetting, and retrieval failure. Research has uh, shown that one of the critical factors that influence memory failure is uh, time. And information is often quickly forgotten, particularly if people do not actively review and uh, hear the information. Sometimes information is simply lost from memory, and in other cases, it was never stored correctly in the first time, in the first place. Sometimes memory complete with uh, one another, making it difficult to remember certain information. In other instances, people actively try to forget things that simply don't want to remember. Of course, no matter how great your memory is, there are probably a few things you can do to make it even better. Fortunately, cognitive uh, uh, psychologists have discovered a number of techniques that can help improve your memory. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, jot it down. The act of writing with a pen and paper helps implant the memory into your brain and can also serve as a reminder or reference later on. Attach meaning to it. It can remember something more easily if you attach meaning to it. For instance, if you associate a person you just meet with someone you already know, you may be able to remember their name easier. Repeat it. Repetition, uh, repetition helps uh, the memory become encoded beyond your short-term memory. 
grouped. Information that it categorized becomes easier to remember and recall. For example, consider the following groups of words desk, apple, bookshelf, red, plum, table, green, pineapple, chair, peach, yellow. Spend a few seconds reading them and then look away and try to recall at least these words. How did you group these words when you listed them? Most people will list using three different categories – color, um, furniture, fruit, and so on. In addition to this technique, keep your brain healthy by exercising regularly, because it's really um, important for our memory uh, to exercise them uh, and uh, try to boost your memory. Sorry, I've got a call. Да. У меня лекция сейчас в Ютубе. Ну, ты скажи, я отвечу быстро. Где? А, ну я объясню, когда лекция закончится. Там легко. Минут 15-20. Ага. Sorry, I've got a call. So, uh, as I said, memory is really important and it's really important to exercise regularly. And then um, your memory will be much, much better. Also, you can download some um, games, for example, on your mobile phone uh, for your memory and try to remember some, for example, color, things, uh, play some games for your memory. It's really helpful, uh, I think, for students. So, human memory is a complex process that researchers are still trying to better understand. Our memory makes us who we are, yet the process is not perfect. While we are able, capable of remembering an uh, astonishing amount of information, we are also um, susceptible to mistakes and some error. And for the memory, uh, we've got interesting methods, it's called priming. So what is priming? In psychology, priming is a technique uh, in which the uh, introduction of one stimulus influences how people respond to a, um, another stimuli. Priming works by activating an association or representation in memory just before another stimulus or task is introduced. This phenomenon occurs without our uh, consciousness awareness, yet it can have a major impact on numerous aspects of our everyday lives. There are many different examples of how the priming works. For example, exposing someone to the word yellow will evoke a faster response to the word banana, that is, will the, uh, to interrelated words like television. Because yellow and banana are more closely linked in memory, people respond faster when the second world is represented. Priming can work with stimuli that are related in a variety of ways. For example, priming effects can occur with uh, perceptually, uh, linguistically or conceptually related stimuli. Priming can have a promising real-world application as a learning and study aid as well. Priming is named as such to evoke the imagery of water well being primed. When the well has been primed, water can then be subsequently produced whenever it is turned on. Once the information has been primed in memory, it can be retrieved into awarenesses more readily. So types. There are several different types of priming in psychology. Each one works in a specific way and may have different effects. Positive and negative priming describe how priming influences processing speed. Positive priming makes processing faster and speed up memory retrieval while negative priming slows it down. Semantic priming involves words that are stated in logical or linguistic way. The early example of responding to the word banana more rapidly after being primed with the word yellow is an example of semantic priming. Associative priming involves using two stimuli uh, that are normally associated with 
one another. For example, cat and mouse are two words that are often linked with one another in memory, so the appearance of one of the words can prime the subject to respond more rapidly when the second word appears. Repetition priming occur when a stimulus and response are repeatedly paired. Because of these subjects become more likely to respond in a certain uh, way more quickly each time the uh, stimulus appears. Perceptual priming involves stimuli that have similar form. For example, the word God will evoke a faster response that is preceded by the word board because these two words are particularly similar. Conceptual priming involves stimuli and response that are uh, conceptually related. Words uh, such as seat and chair are likely to show priming effects because they are the same conceptual category. Masked priming involves parts of the initial stimuli being obscured in some way, such as uh, with harsh marks. Even though the entire stimuli is not visible, it still awoke a response. So, the priming process, uh, psychologists believe that um, units of information are stored in long-term memory. The activation of this uh, uh, can either be increased or decreased in a variety of ways. When the activation of certain units of information is increased, this memory becomes easier to access. When activation is decreased, the information becomes less likely to be retrieved from memory. Priming suggests that certain uh, means tend to be activated in unison. unison. By activating some uh, units of information, related or connected units also became active. So, how you learn? Teachers and educators can also utilize priming as a learning tool. Some students perform better when they know what they can expect. Tackling new material can sometimes be uh, intimidating, but priming students by presenting information before a lesson is giving a help. Priming is often used as an educational intervention for students with certain learning uh, disabilities. New material is presented before it is thought allowing the students to become comfortable with it. For example, students might be able to preview the book or material that are going to be used as part of a lesson. Because they are already familiar with the information and material, they may be better able to pay attention during the actual lesson. While priming takes place outside of conscious awareness, this psychological phenomenon can play an important role in your daily life, from influencing how you interpret information to your behavior, priming can play a part in your perception, emotion and action. And it's a really interesting part. And also uh, on this picture you can see um, another small game. Uh, sometimes to prime, sometimes to um, pay attention. We can see the word blue, black, white and so on, but we see another color. and. To, for example, exercise your brain, you need to call very fast. Uh, you see, for example, blue, but you need to say the color. It's like red, green, blue, black, red, blue, yellow, um, purple, red, yellow. And you need to try to do it faster and faster. And try uh, not to read yellow. You need to say black because color is black. Uh, and it's a really interesting exercise for your brain, like this. And the last video we will watch for today is for our memory and how we make this memory. Clive Waring was playing the piano alone in his room. When his wife came into the room, he immediately leapt up and embraced her with joyful enthusiasm. A minute later, she slipped out to grab a glass of water, and when she returned, he gave her that same bright greeting as if she'd been gone for days. And then he did it again and again. Clive was an accomplished London musician until in 1985, at the age of 47, he contracted a rare herpes encephalitis virus that ravaged his central nervous system. Since then, he's been unable to remember almost any of his past 
or to make new memories. His wife is the only person he recognizes, but he can never recall the last time he saw her. This may be the most profound case of extreme and chronic amnesia ever recorded. Our memory helps make us who we are, whether recognizing loved ones, recalling past joys, or just remembering how to like walk and talk and fry an egg. Memory is the chain that connects our past to our present. If it breaks, we're left untethered, incapable of leaving the present moment and unable to embrace the future. But memory isn't an all or nothing thing, of course. Waring can't remember any details about his personal past, but he still remembers how to speak English and get dressed and play the piano. Some memories you process automatically, and they are stored differently than your more personal or factual memories, like your first kiss, or how to recite pi to 12 places, or who won the Peloponnesian War. Speaking of ancient Greeks, and to help demonstrate what I'm talking about, I want you to have a look at our Spartan friend here and remember his name, because we're gonna be testing your memory in just a minute. Technically, memory is learning that has persisted over time. Information that has been stored, and in many cases, can be recalled. Except, of course, during the exam. Our memories are typically accessed in three different ways. Through recall, recognition, and relearning. And if you think about all the different kinds of tests you've taken in school, they're all actually designed to size up how you access stored information in these ways. Like, recall is how you reach back into your mind and bring up information, just as you do in fill-in-the-blank tests. So if I say blank is the capital of Greece, your brain hopefully would just recall the answer as Athens. Recognition, meanwhile, is more like the multiple choice test. You only need to identify old information when presented with it, as in which of the following was not an ancient city in Greece, Athens, Marathon, Pompeii, or Sparta. And relearning is sort of like refreshing or reinforcing old information. So when you study for a final exam, you relearn things you half forgot more easily than you did when you were first learning them like, say, a basic timeline of the Greek Empire. But how? How does all of that data that we're exposed to all the time every day become memory? Well, in the late 1960s, American psychologists Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifrin figured out enough about the process of memory formation to break it down into three stages. First, it's encoded into the brain, then stored for future use, and then eventually retrieved. Sounds simple, but by now you've figured out that just because you take a lot of stuff about your mind for granted doesn't mean that it is not complicated. By Atkinson and Schifrin's model, we first record things we want to remember as an immediate but fleeting sensory memory. Think back to the image I showed you a minute ago. You remember his name? If you do, it's because you successfully managed to shuffle it into your short-term memory, where you probably encoded it through rehearsal. This is how you briefly remember something like a password or phone number. Like, hey Tommy, what's Jenny's number? Okay, 867. 5309. 8675309. 8675309. You're getting it in your head there. Or in this case, I told you to remember that guy's name. Maybe you were thinking Leonidas repeatedly over and over, even if you didn't think you were doing it. But this information really only stays in your short term memory for under 30 seconds without a lot of rehearsal. So if you weren't repeating Leonidas, you probably have forgotten it already. Because your mind, amazing as it is, can really only hold between four and seven distinct bits of information at a time, at which point the memory either decays or it gets transferred into long-term memory. Long-term memory is your brain's like durable and ridiculously spacious storage unit holding all of your knowledge, skills, and experiences. Now, since the days of Atkinson and Schifrin, psychologists have recognized that the classical definition of short-term memory didn't really capture all of the processes involved in the transfer of information to your long-term memory. I mean, it's more than being able to just remember some Greek guy's name, so later generations of psychologists visited the whole idea of short-term memory and updated it to the more comprehensive concept of working memory. Working memory involves all the ways that we take short-term information and stash it in our long-term stores, and increasingly we think of it as involving both explicit and implicit processes. When we store information consciously and actively, that's an explicit process. We make the most of this aspect of working memory when we study, for instance, so that we can know that Athens is the capital of Greece and that Pompeii was a Roman town and not a Greek one. This is how we capture facts and knowledge that we think we're going to need. Like I told you
told you specifically to remember Leonidas's name, you concentrated on that detail and filed it away, if briefly. But of course we're not conscious of every tiny thing that we take in, yet our working memory often transfers stuff we're not aware of to long-term storage. We call that an implicit process, the kind you don't have to actively concentrate on. A good example might be classically conditioned associations, like if you get all sweaty and nervous at the dentist because you had a root canal last year. You don't need to pull up that file on the last time you got your face drilled on to think, well, oh, oral surgery, not my favorite. Instead, implicit processes cover all that stuff automatically. This kind of automatic processing is hard to shut off. Unless you got something unusual going on in your brain, you might not have much choice but to learn this way, like how you learned how to not put your hand into a fire. That learning would have happened pretty much automatically as soon as you first yanked your hand away from an open flame. Whether those things are lodged in there explicitly or implicitly or both, there are also different kinds of long-term memory. For instance, procedural memory refers to how we remember to do things, like riding a bike or reading. It's effortful to learn at first, but eventually you can do it without thinking about it. Long-term memory can also be episodic, tied to specific episodes of your life. Like, remember that time that Bernice fell out of her chair at chemistry and everybody started laughing uncontrollably? Man, good times. There are other types of long-term memory, too, and we're continually learning more about the biology and psychology of the whole complex complex phenomenon. For instance, while Clive Waring's episodic memories, among others, seem to be deeply affected, his procedural memories for things seem to be in one piece. This has to do with neuroanatomy that we do not have time to explore here and that we don't yet fully understand. Waring and others have a lot to teach us about the different types of long-term memory storage. Now, for healthy memories, there are lots of little tricks you can use to help remember information. Mnemonics, for one, help with memorization, and I'm sure you know a few that take the form of acronyms. Roy G. Biv for the colors of the rainbow, for instance. Mnemonics work in part by organizing items into familiar, manageable units in a process called chunking. For example, it may be hard to recall a seven-digit number, but it'll be easier to commit to memory in the rhythm of a phone number, 8675309. Or you could just write a song about it. Strategies like mnemonics and chunking can help you with explicit processes, but how well you retain your data can depend on how deep you dig through the different levels of processing. Shallow processing, for for instance, lets you encode information on really basic auditory or visual levels based on the sound, structure, or appearance of a word. So if you're trying to commit the name Leonidas to your explicit memory using shallow processing, you might encode the word by recalling the cool font you saw it in. But to really retain that information, you'd want to activate your deep processing, which encodes semantically based on actual meaning associated with the word. In this case, you might remember the story of that mega tough yet very scantily clad warrior of ancient Greece. Or you might remember that Leon means lion in Greek, and that lions are tough fighters, and that Leonidas was a tough Spartan warrior king. And then to really, really make it stick, you want to connect it to something meaningful or related to your own personal emotional experience. Like maybe Gerard Butler's bronzed eight-pack torso and unconquerable bloodlust helped lock down the word Spartan and Leonidas in your memory forever. I mean, maybe. if. If that helps you. In the end, how much information you encode and remember depends on both the time you took to learn it and how you made it personally relevant to you. Memory is extremely powerful. It's constantly shaping and reshaping your brain, your life, and your identity. Clive Waring is still himself on the outside, but in his inability to recall who he was or process what has happened, he has lost some critically important part of himself. Our memories may haunt us or sustain us, but either way, they define us. Without them, we are left to wander alone in the dark. If you were committing this lesson to memory, you learned about how we encode and store in memory, the difference between implicit automatic and effortful explicit processing, how shallow and deep processing work, and a few types of long-term storage. Thank you for watching. And especially to our subable subscribers who make this whole channel possible. So, this is what video about our memory with different examples with different interesting story so uh, today we discuss very important moment in cognitive psychology perception attention and memory uh, there were way of uh, processing information from our perception for incoming sensory stimulation to complex memory processes 
Attention is a process by which we narrow down the mass of stimuli that affect us to a measurable amount of information. Perception is the process of meaningful uh, perceiving the stimuli we pay attention to. And memory is the process of storing this perceived information for the purpose of remembering it in the future. And of course, these three parts, perception, attention, and memory, really, really interesting and important and uh, interesting in psychology. Uh, next time we will also speak about emotion. You can see here, for example, we speak just about this, attention, we speak about perception, memory, and emotion, feelings, a bit motivation. Uh, we will speak about them uh, in our last lecture about psychology. So, this is our lecture about perception, attention, and memory. And uh, uh, next seminar uh, on the portal USU, you will see test. Uh, test about this lecture, lecture number four, and about lecture number three also. Because uh, we uh, don't have any test or question about lecture number three. So for the next seminar, you need to read one more time lecture number three and lecture number four. And it will be test in Portal Usu, like test number um, two. So you will see it uh, on your seminar day. Uh, you've got different schedules, so depends of uh, our schedule. Uh, you will see this test, uh, answer this question in Portal Usu, and then see your um, mark. And I remember you that uh, all group you've got big task about psychological school and direction. And please don't forget about your deadline. So I waiting for your presentation and I uh, remind you that you need to title your presentation like your topic name, student name and group number. Uh, please, because I already see mistake, uh, the students just call presentation, presentation psychology or something like that. You need to title your presentation like uh, topic name, student name and group number. Uh, I just remember you, remind you. So I see a lot of students, it's great. I will check also group. I see different group here, 19, 26, 14, 13, 23, 25, 26, 14, 18. A lot of students, 25 group. 13 group, 16, 15 group also. Good job. And later at home I will check this chart one more time, of course. 15, 17, 27, 26, 26, 29, 18, 17, You don't need to write so many times. 26, 24, 15. Aha, uh -huh. great. So this presentation I downloaded to um, WhatsApp uh, chat for your mentor. And later also I download this presentation to Portal Usu. And uh, you can download it, read it carefully, uh, because uh, we've got tests about uh, this lecture and previous lecture. Because for now we are finished with our lecture number four. And remind you that our next lecture will be in November, 12th of November. And uh, the link is the same, the same link. You can see this link in portal also. You can see this link in the uh, WhatsApp chat for the mentor. So link is the same. But I uh, always copy them one more time in the, uh, and in the beginning of our, on this day, it's Friday. So I remind you, please don't forget about your deadline. The test 
will be um, on the, our seminar day. So, for example, we've got different schedule. With group number, for example, uh, 24, 22, and 20, we meet each other in Tuesday, and you will see test at Tuesday. Group number 17, 18, you will see your test uh, uh, also at Wednesday. Uh, it's another group. We will work uh, in university. Group uh, like 29, 27, 28, 31, one, they will see the test in Tuesday in um, yours again. So uh, we've got schedule. Uh, it's um, schedule for all group. Uh, different group got um, seminar at, for example, Tuesday, another group at uh, uh, Wednesday, another group at Thursday, and so on. So you will see your test uh, in portal also near your schedule. And also, if you've got another question, you can write uh, to, to your mentor and mentor write to me, or you can write uh, in portal also. We've got messenger there. So, right now we finished our lecture because uh, the time is 12.30 and uh, we'll discuss everything. Uh, also, if you've got another question, please write in portal also, or your mentor, please contact me. And uh, um, see you on seminar in portal also, and see you next lecture in November. Goodbye.